You might recall our previous chat about creepy dolls and the life they take on while no one is watching. But no doll story is more grotesque than the one we're about to discuss. In fact, tonight's true tale deals with some heavy topics and is not for the squeamish or faint of heart. Because in this case, it's not about what the dolls do. It's the morbid truth about what they contain and the horrors that led to their creation. I'm Dre of the Dead, and it's time to feed your head. Anatoly Moskvin was a shy, intelligent, and socially awkward child. Born in 1966 to parents Yuri and Elvira, his life in Soviet Russia was one filled with trauma. At the age of eight, he was sexually assaulted by an unknown man. When his parents asked about the numerous bruises and changed demeanor, the usually meek young boy lashed out. In response, his parents distanced themselves, creating a familial isolation that extended well into the rest of his life. Despite excelling academically, Anatoly was often bullied and ostracized by his classmates. He spent most of his time alone reading books and teaching himself various languages. In March of 1979, Anatoly experienced yet another traumatic event, this time changing the course of his life. Recycling was mandatory in Russian schools, and classes often held competitions for who could pick up the most trash. At age 12, this led Anatoly to the yard of an unfamiliar house, where he witnessed nearly two dozen people in black robes. He heard them singing in a language he couldn't understand, and cautiously peeked in. That's when he noticed the many lit candles and the coffin. He tried to back away slowly, but a hand gripped his shoulder. A large Hungarian woman brought him inside and led him up to the coffin. Her daughter, 11-year-old Natasha Petrova, lay lifeless inside. She'd stepped on a loose electrical cable while emerging from a bath. In some parts of Russia, it's customary for friends and family to kiss the deceased twice. In this case, Natasha's mother handed Anatoly an apple and requested that he kiss her daughter. The young boy burst into tears and struggled to back away, but was held firmly by the adults. They pushed his head toward the girl, and he reluctantly placed his lips on Natasha's forehead. Soon after, two copper rings were brought forth and Anatoly was instructed to place one on the girl's hand and the other on his own. After which, he was awarded a fruit basket and some rubles, warned not to tell anyone of what had just occurred, and was then released. It wasn't long before Anatoly began to have dreams about Natasha. In fact, she began to visit him nightly and was insistent about teaching him black magic. Though he refused, night after night she persisted. He visited her hometown and for a short while the dreams stopped. But when he returned, they started again. Tormented, he finally confessed this to his parents who decided to take him to a doctor. His troubles were written off as puberty and he was prescribed valerian to help him sleep. After years of visits from Natasha, it seemed she was finally getting tired of Anatoly's reluctance. She instructed him to carry out a simple ceremony using a classmate's tooth to pass the burden on to someone else. After this, her visits stopped, though he occasionally visited her grave to pay his respects. Anatoly spent his college years studying philology at the Moscow State University. Still enraptured by his love of linguistics, he spoke an astounding 13 languages, but another fascination overtook him. His interest in cemeteries and the occult had grown, so he joined the Luciferian community and embraced the left-handed path. He took part in their rituals, passed their tests, and swore a vow of celibacy and sobriety. Soon, he began to regret shunning Natasha's teachings. Upon graduation, he began teaching Celtology at his local university. He went on to publish two Russian-English dictionaries and two linguistic dictionaries for children. Most of the staff found him to be punctual, kind, and somewhat of a genius. 
Some felt he was difficult and eccentric, and after a few disagreements, he left to focus on writing and tutoring. In fact, he became a popular tutor for children, helping them learn language, history, and literature, and found the experience rewarding. In 2003, Anatoly finally met a kindred soul. Yulia Granova was a spiritual woman focused on Indian religions. Due to his vow of celibacy, the two began a non-sexual relationship. Yulia played muse to Anatoly's writings, and for some time they were quite happy with their arrangement. Eventually, Yulia yearned for a child, and Anatoly had wanted the same for years. They attempted to adopt a young girl, but their application was rejected due to Anatoly's lack of stable income. His work as a journalist for several newspapers was sporadic at best, and he still lived with his parents who were footing most of the bill. They disapproved of his adoption efforts, leading to tensions in which he responded, Well, fine mom, I'll just reach out to the dead. His mother was used to this kind of eccentric behavior and told him to do whatever he wanted. Soon, his relationship also ended. In July of 2008, Anatoly set off on a new endeavor. He partnered with famed historian Oleg Ryabov to publish a book on cemeteries and local history throughout the region. For three years, he walked 18 miles a day to visit graveyards, reading books along the way. He would usually arrive at dusk to scrape moss from old headstones and document information. With limited transportation available, he often slept on graves or haystacks and, in one case, even in an abandoned coffin. Sometimes he was awoken by grave robbers or police, but was usually left alone after providing his credentials. On more than a few occasions, he was robbed or beaten by drunk civilians and found himself having to drink puddle water to stay hydrated. Between 2005 and 2007, he'd visited 752 cemeteries in 35 districts and found himself profoundly exhausted. From 2006 to 2010, Anatoly became the target of much criticism due to his writings. In articles, he accused the Tatar people from the 13th and 15th century of mass rape throughout Russia. In 2008, he released a book on the history of the swastika as a solar symbol until the 19th century. As a result, he was labeled a fascist extremist and ended up on the radar of Russian anti-terrorist officials. After the 2011 Damodidava airport bombings, Anatoly visited a Muslim cemetery where he defaced tombstones and affixed newspaper clippings of the victims' names. This came shortly after a flurry of anti-Muslim activity throughout the region and gave officials everything they finally needed to apprehend him. On November 2, 2011, the Ministry of Internal Affairs raided Anatoly's apartment, expecting to find a wealth of extremist materials, of which there were none. What they actually found was worse than anything they'd ever imagined. Twenty-six human-sized dolls lined Anatoly's bedroom and garage. Each were wearing women's clothing and were all crudely painted with makeup. Some even had music boxes embedded in their chests in order to speak. Upon picking up the dolls, officials found that they rattled when shaken and decided to take a closer look. What they found within each doll were the mummified remains of human bodies. Anatoly was subsequently arrested. As a result, his father suffered a heart attack and his mother was also hospitalized. Despite living with the dolls for 10 years, they claimed they had no idea what was stored inside. One he called Masha was even kept in their room. Friends and family even visited and remarked on their artistry. The only concern came when Anatoly would speak to the dolls, which would prompt his mother to ask, Are you a child? It was found that each of the dolls contained the remains of young girls who had suffered tragic or violent deaths. Their age range was debated with most sources claiming girls 3 to 12 years of age and others speculating women as old as 30. 
While awaiting his trial, Anatoly cooperated with the police, freely providing them with the names and cemetery locations of each girl. In one interview, he laid out his process. Inspired by the Druid tradition of sleeping on graves to commune with the dead, he slept on the graves of children to listen to what they had to say. Their spirits, he said, came to him, some asking to be rescued. His first exhumation took place on May 9, 2003. Following the disagreement he had with his parents over adoption, he visited a graveyard. Armed with a shovel and a chisel, he dug into a grave and hollowed out a hole in the coffin lid, pulling out what was left of the body. He then placed the remains in a remote corner of the cemetery, in an abandoned grave, for mummification. He placed baking soda and salt in discarded stockings and tied them to the remains. He changed them once a week, claiming he was feeding the birds whenever someone would inquire. Two months later, he returned to the grave and carried the body back in a backpack for what he called restoration. There, he stuffed the remains with cloth and rags and dressed them in women's clothing he'd taken from the trash. He applied paper, paint, and makeup to the face of the deceased. The mummification to restoration process was slow and methodical, and he executed it one body at a time. At home, he talked to the dolls, claiming they'd established their own hierarchy, language, holidays, and songs. He kept his favorites in his room and placed the ones he liked less in the garage. He played them children's music, held birthday parties, and offered them food in the Celtic tradition. When asked why he did it, he claimed he'd always wanted a daughter of his own to share his knowledge with. He also believed that one day through future advancements in cloning, that they could be revived. He denied any sexual attraction to the dolls, claiming he cared for them as his own children. Anatoly's trial began in May of 2012. He faced five years imprisonment for the desecration of 44 graves, but was quickly deemed insane and unfit for trial. He was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and sentenced to indefinite psychiatric holding with a case review every six months. During the trial, parents of the deceased called for life sentencing and even death. He was ordered to pay $75,000 to each family, though one father rejected compensation, stating, He treated my daughter better than I had during her life. He dressed her, put her to bed, read her fairy tales, and showed her cartoons. In June of 2015, Moskvin's usual six-month review took place, but this time, he had a new defense. Violet Volkova, a human rights lawyer most known for her defense of the feminist band Pussy Riot, alleged that Moskvin received frequent beatings by both guards and patients. She also claimed that he was kept mostly in isolation and given up to 15 pills per day, keeping him sedated and unable to write. She demanded his transfer to an independent clinic in Moscow for re-examination. Anatoly remains under psychiatric arrest. For the past few years, he's been building a case for release and hopes to marry his 25-year-old girlfriend, whose identity remains a mystery. He remains unapologetic for his actions, stating, They buried their daughters, and this is where I believe their rights over them finished. So no, I would not apologize. You abandoned your girls in the cold. I brought them home and warmed them up. If you enjoyed this strange but true tale, be sure to subscribe and check out previous episodes. We put out new videos every other Friday. If you're a fan of blooper reels and behind the scenes footage, you might consider subscribing to my Patreon. These are just a few of the patrons who make these videos possible. As always, thank you so, so much for watching. Be well and stay strange.